morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. If uh, everybody would like to kind of congregate to the middle, you can feel free to have a seat. If you prefer to stand, feel free to do that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started on things. Um, first of all, welcome. Thank you for coming out uh, on this rainy day. And if you're at home watching live or recorded, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're gathered here today to talk about funding in Ohio, which uh, sounds like a very boring topic, except for the way it impacts all of us so much. Uh, the bill that they're working on right now would hit schools, it would hit libraries, townships, cities, everybody. So we're gathered here today to learn more so we can do more. We have Cynthia Peebles here from Honesty for Ohio Education. She's going to give us kind of a rundown of what's happening funding-wise. Also give kind of an emergency update on some of the other horrendous bills working their way through the State House right now uh, that are moving a little quicker than they should. So we'll then hear from one of uh, our church's members, Sarah Popovic, as a parent and what this means for her kids and for the services they rely on. And then we also have a letter from a local librarian that I'll read. So that's kind of our rundown for today. For folks that are here in person, uh, the most important info, if you walk out that door and to the right, you'll find the bathrooms, as well as a water fountain. So if you uh, feel the need for a bio break, simply uh, arise and go. Also, uh, over here where the TV is, is where our there's paper and pens to write letters. So as you're hearing Cynthia talk or Sarah or from the letter and you feel ready to write, there's the paper, there's the clipboards and pens, have at it as needed. So without further ado, I'll invite Cynthia on up. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, as Brian said, I'm Cynthia Peoples, a founding director of Honesty for Ohio Education. We are a not, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, we're a nonpartisan statewide coalition that educates and advocates for honest education, the affirmation of all identities, cultures, and lived experiences in the classroom. And we especially advocate for the rights and safety of our students, um, of our educators, and our families that live in um, school district communities. Um, we advocate at three different lanes um, and access to public education at the State House, at the State Board of Education, and in our local schools because we know that there's a lot of hate and harm that's coming in at all three of those access points. So we are a very busy <laughs> coalition. Um, I also sit on the state board of the League of Women Voters um, and we know that our democracy is on fire right now as well and where I'm living right now with the education coalition and with democracy we are all at living at the intersection of education information and democracy and when one is in jeopardy the other is in jeopardy which is why I'm so thankful that you're all here today. Um, what I'm going to do is unpack some pretty significant bills that are sitting in our state house right now that are really impacting um, needed funding um, that should be directed towards public education but is really being diverted and divested from public education um, and really going to prioritize privatized education. So um, the first thing that I'm going to unpack is House Bill 1 which is a massive taxation bills um, that hits more than just education, but it particularly guts public education um, and local governments and our local libraries as well. Um, so House Bill 1 is sponsored by Rep. Adam Matthews out of Lebanon District 56. Um, and right now this bill is sitting in the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, first thing that you all need to know is that this bill is having a hearing on Tuesday this Tuesday um, at 2.30 in room 122. And I tell you this because it is, um, it is a hearing that is inviting all testimony. So they will hear proponent testimony, interested party, interested party testimony, and opponent testimony. So this is our opportunity 
as voting Ohioans, as taxpaying Ohioans, and as concerned Ohioans to have our voices heard about how we feel about this bill and how it's going to impact how we live in our communities and how we educate um, our students. So um, the first thing that this bill is going to do is essentially um, reduce the state income tax by $2 billion. Um, one of the ways it's going to do that is it's going to um, change our, tra our tax structure from a graduated rate structure uh, to a flat tax of 2.75. Um, the graduated rate uh, was actually um, instituted back in 1972 when we first came up with our um, state income tax structure. Um, so, um, so it's going to move us from graduated to flat tax rate. Um, the other um, big uh, pillar of this bill is that it's going to eliminate um, a property tax relief program, which we all know, or some of us may know, as the 10% rollback. Um, and this 10% rollback is, our, is for residential and agricultural property. You may also know this as the non-business tax credit as well. Um, and what this is going to do is um, it's essentially going to, uh, right now what it does um, before the flat tax is it saves um, taxpayers roughly $1.2 billion in local to, local property taxes, what our current um, graduated tax rate does. Um, and that $1.2 billion that we have right now is what goes into our public schools and what goes into our local government. Um, and of that $1.2 billion, roughly $800 million of that goes directly into our schools. And we love that because we know that our local schools and our public schools need that funding. Um, the rest of that money, um, the roughly 400 million, goes into our municipalities, our townships, our counties, our libraries, which we know um, we love our libraries to be fully funded as well. Um, now, moving us over to a flat tax, what's going to happen is that 10% in savings um, that we enjoy right now is going to be sitting in our laps. So it's actually going to increase um, our taxes by by 10%. So that 10% that we're not paying right now, we will be paying, and it will take the um, it will take the government's role, the state's role, out of funding that 10% for our local schools and make us fund it as taxpayers. What this bill also does is it reduces the assessment percentage um, for residential and um, agricultural property. It reduces that assessment from 35% to 31.5%. Um, and this assessment, this reduction, is intended to offset that 10% rollback that, um, that we won't have anymore. So that's how this bill is going to make up that 10%. Um, and it reduces the amount of, um, of taxes owed on all fixed rate property tax levies um, that are in place across the state. And ultimately, what this is going to do to our schools and our local government is that any of those schools or government entities that do not, um, that do not have a bond or emergency levies, they stand to lose roughly 10% of, uh, of the revenue from the property taxes, um, which we know could potentially devastate so many of our public schools. Uh, Okay, so that's the first bill, and like I said, this bill is having a hearing on Tuesday. We, um, that was a really like <laughs> reduced, condensed version of this bill and um, the cliff notes, if you will, and we break this down much more on our website. If you want to head over um, honestyforohioeducation.org, Ohio you can learn a lot more about the bill there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to some bills that directly impact education, um, House Bill 11, which is known as the Backpack Bill. Um, we have two bills, the Backpack Bill um, and then the expansion of, um, of Ed Choice, which are essentially trying to create what you may know the common nomenclature right now is a universal voucher program. Um, so 
What the backpack bill does, these two bills are a little bit different, but in essence, they're divesting money from public education to give to students so that they can go to private schools. So what the backpack bill does is it creates these annual education savings accounts for all K-12 students across Ohio. And in these um, ESAs for short, it provides um, $5,500 for K through eight students and $7,500 for high school students to attend private education. And that's money that would have been going into public schools. The kicker is, is that um, these ESAs are, to be, are, um, are available for private schools. However, where all of our students live, particularly in our rural communities, they don't have access to these schools. So in the rural communities that don't have access to these private schools, the money is being leached out of their districts and the kids can't even use it. The families can't even use it. Um, so this is really devastating um, to our rural communities. And these ESAs, they don't just live here in Ohio. Um, this is becoming a trend across the country and it's having the same harm and impact on rural communities across the country. And the, the impact on the rural communities isn't talked about um, nearly enough. There isn't enough surround sound about that. And what we have to think about in terms of the rural communities if, is when you look at the legislators that are trying to pass these ESA type bills, they tend to be conservative legislators. And when we look at the voting dynamic or the voting um, patterns in rural communities, they tend to be conservative voters. And the, <laughs> the folks that live in those rural communities, they may not understand what the people that they're voting for are actually trying to do to their local school district. So it's really important that we're able to connect the dots um, for those legislators or um, for those communities about the, the legislators and the harm of these, of these bills. Um, the backpack bill would also replace three current voucher programs that we have in Ohio right now, which is EdChoice, um, EdChoice Expansion, and then the Cleveland Scholarship. So these ESA accounts would kind of become the, um, the voucher system, um, but called education savings accounts. This bill, um, is up for a hearing on Tuesday, April 25th as well, at four o'clock, invited opponent testimony. Again, we have a full landing page that breaks, it, breaks down all of the details of this bill, um, and we really lay out the harm that will happen, um, not only just to the rural districts, but across the state as well, because what we have to remember is they're divesting public funds to pay for privatized education. Not all of our kids even if the schools are in their communities, not all of our kids have access to those schools because private schools are very selective about who they admit into their schools for a whole host of different reasons. And they're using public funds to discriminate and be selective about who they actually educate. Our taxpayer money <laughs> is being used for them to be selective about who they educate. Um, so that's House Bill 11, and the, um, the primary sponsors for that bill are Rep. McLean and Rep. Marilyn St. John. That bill right now is living in the House Primary and Secondary Education Committee. Um, the, um, the other bill that's living in the Senate, so we have a bill in the House and we have one in the Senate, um, is, um, is the Ed Choice Expansion Bill. And this bill is sponsored by Senator Sandra O'Brien. This bill lives in the Senate Education Committee. Um, and this bill is not moving next week. Thankfully, I can't tell you how many bills I'm looking at next week. Thankfully, this one isn't moving. Um, it has had several hearings, unfortunately, though. It's, um, it's had the sponsor hearing, a proponent round, and then it's also had an interested party round um, back in early March and hasn't really moved such. Um, much since then because some of the language and funding has been hardwired into our state budget, which I'm gonna get to in just a second, which we don't love. Um, but to unpack Senate Bill 11, um, essentially what Senate Bill 11 does is it increases access to vouchers 
for all K-12 students. So it's expanding what we know as Ed Choice and making every student across Ohio eligible for Ed Choice vouchers. And what that's doing is it's providing $5,500, similar to the backpack program or the backpack bill. Um, it's providing $5,500 for our K-8 students and then um, $7,500 for our high school students. Um, again, um, when, we, when we look at um, divesting needed funds away from public education to put it to these, um, these private schools and these charter schools, um, you know, a lot of the justification is that our public schools are failing our kids, which they're not. Um, this is a lot of misinformation, um, misinformation and disinformation that's, that's being spread around. Um, and instead of fully funding and um, fully resourcing our public schools and helping support and reinforce what our educators and what our administrators are doing, they're pulling more money out of public education and trying to fund these alternative, um, these alternative programs. So, uh, like I said, this bill um, has not been moving too much since early March, but, and I'm gonna segue state in, straight into the state budget, um, what the state budget has been doing, um, the state budget is sitting in the House right now, and as of, I wanna say, last week, part of this Ed Choice expansion has been written into the state budget. So, um, it doesn't necessarily make Ed Choice vouchers available to all K-12 students, but what it has done is that it has increased eligibility from families that are living at 300% above the poverty line to now it has raised it to um, families are eligible that live at 450% above the poverty line. So which equates to about a family with um, like a $133,000 um, annual salary, you know, with, with four kids. So it's the, the Ed Choice was really for our lower income families, impoverished families, um, and now it's increased that quite a bit. Um, and again, it's offering those families $5,500 for K-8 and then $7,500 for our for our high school students. Um, state budget also, um, are you all familiar with how the state budget kind of, how it's actually going to be operationalized, what that order of operations is? No? Okay. So um, how the life cycle of, of our biennial state budget is um, with this new general assembly that just started in January, the governor puts together his wish list of what he wants for the state budget. Um, so he, he puts his executive budget together, um, um, unpacks it, explains what it is, works with ODE on, um, on the education piece and looks at transportation, um, the GRF, and, um, and then from the governor, it moves over to the house and then the House gets to introduce the House version of what they want for the budget, which is where they've been living for like the last month or two. Um, and you may have seen in the State House, there's been a lot of invitations for different folks to come in and um, advocate or push back against particular line items in the House version of the budget. Um, and right now, the House version of the budget should be wrapping up this upcoming week, so they'll have a finalized version and then when the House is done with it, then it moves over to the Senate. And then the Senate looks at what their wish list is, and they're looking at the House version right now, and the Senate puts together their version of it, and then when the Senate is done, then um, the House and the Senate come together to kind of build the state budget based on what the House wants and what the Senate wants. Um, and the deadline for getting a state budget is um, at the end of June. I wanna say it's July 1st. Um, so you can imagine because they're legislators and you know that's kind of the, the, um, the way the machine works there's a lot of negotiating and horse trading that goes on for both chambers to be happy with the budget um, and we don't always have a say in, in what that looks like you know the final and what can also happen is popular or unpopular bills can get written into 
the state budget, which really takes a lot of power from us as voters and taxpayers um, to have any influence over where our taxpayer money goes, you know, how that money is appropriated. Um, so um, the House budget, their version is just about to wrap up, um, and the Senate right now, um, next week, they have um, three different hearings across the week where they're looking at the almost finalized version of the House version, just kind of getting ready for what's about to come into their, into their chamber. So um, one of the big things um, in the almost final st House version of the budget that I just told you about was this expansion of Ed Choice that's been written into the bill. Um, some good news is um, there's been um, a lot of positive momentum around the Fair School Funding Plan. Um, the Fair School Funding Plan is a formula um, that provides, that will finally make our um, public education, the way that we fund public education, fair, equitable, and constitutional, <laughs> because we know that we have been living in, in this unconstitutional approach to funding um, Ohio public education. So there's been this incredible solution that's been on the table to you know, make us whole. Um, but our legislature has not been willing to completely codify that, and we only got two years' worth of the fair school funding plan into the budget in the last General Assembly, so it has been reintroduced into this budget, um, and it's looking like we've made um, some pretty good headway. Um, so we're really happy, we're really happy about that. Um, part of what's been included into the fair school funding formula component of the budget um, is that they are going to use um, a lot of updated information to determine what the base cost of educating each student in their district is, which, if you can believe, we don't do that right now. Sc public school funding is not based on what it actually costs to educate a student, and our current approach to um, funding public education is really over-reliant on property valuation and property taxes, not what it actually takes to educate a student, which is awful, um, which is why we have so many underfunded, um, impoverished school districts right now. So we had some, um, some pretty big successes around the fair school funding. Um, we didn't get transportation fully funded, so we're not happy about that. In fact, one of the line items um, in the state budget is um, that, <laughs> that our local schools have to pay to transport K through eight students using vouchers. So we have to use public school transportation to transport those kids to um, their, their schools, which we already know public transportation is already so strapped right now. We're short on, um, on the vehicles, we're short on the drivers. Um, so adding those additional routes not only does it lengthen the time, but it also wears down on the vehicles as well. And if you're pulling more money out of, out of our public education budget, that's less maintenance for those buses in addition to being able to pay people to drive the buses. So not a great win. Um, um, they did delete, uh, the House was able to remove a very big line item in the budget to fund SROs, um, school resource officers, in our school districts. Um, we know <laughs> across the country that some of the solutions for um, the school shootings is to, here in Ohio, to harden our schools by arming our teachers and to flood our school districts with um, school resource officers, which for, you that, for, you, for those of you that don't know are essentially um, law enforcement, police officers, sheriffs that are in school districts all day, which can be pretty traumatizing for some of our kids that don't have a great relationship with um, law enforcement, you know, for some very systemic reasons. Um, but there was a there was a line item in the budget that um, was going to um, appropriate several millions of dollars to fund SROs and districts, and all of that was removed. And now that money has been used for other ways to fund public education, um, which we're happy about. Um, and there was also um, a big win for, for our educators. The starting salary for our educators is right now 30,000 and that in this budget has been increased to 40,000. So, um, but again, this is just the House version right now um, and when it gets over to the Senate, we've got some 
senators that aren't really great friends of public education. So, you know, we're all just kind of like clenching our fists, <laughs> waiting to see what the, what the Senate is going to do with this version of the bill. Um, the third grade reading guarantee, removing the, um, the retention provision in the third grade reading guarantee was also hardwired into the budget. Um, that's a whole other program, um, um, but we are happy about that. Um, and then some big wins around uh, mental health um, resources and funding for our students as well. Uh, okay, so those, those are the big bills that, um, that I live with in terms of having an immediate impact on public education. Um, I'll pause here if there are any questions and then I'll kind of move over to some of these rapid response bills that are also going to be moving next week as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, um, probably the easiest place to start with that question is to be able to connect the dots on all of these issues. Um, you know, th the reason why our coalition was even birthed was to push back against this national extremist agenda that is bringing all of these bills that we're seeing right now into state houses across the country. Um, they all look like they're independent and disparate um, efforts, but they're all actually together. And it's the same um, national organizations that are coordinating it, that are funding it, that are writing the model, res the, the model legislation for it, copycat bills as we know, um, these ESAs, these universal vouchers, um, you know, um, going into, um, you know, creating a flat tax. These are all things that are states to the south, particularly Texas and Florida, um, are doing. And, you know, Texas and Florida around public education are really in a race to the bottom right now, and Ohio is running right after them, trying to race to the bottom with them, unfortunately. Ohio loves to take its cues from Governor DeSantis and Florida, um, which we hate. Um, we've got this line now that what happens in Florida should stay in Florida. Um, <laughs> but I say that to say, um, our messaging around this is we have to look at it in its totality because otherwise th there, there won't be a coordinated effort around it. And we work closely with um, school districts, particularly superintendents and school boards to make sure that they understand where this attack is coming from. We try to preview you know, what's coming down the pipe because we can see what the pattern is across the country. Um, and help them understand what the bill looks like, what kind of traction it's going to have, and then give them the tools and the information for them to be, become advocates not only at their local school board, but also at the state house. Several of the bills that we advocate around and engage legis legislators around, we need the superintendent and the administrator voice, the treasurers, um, you know, we need the, the local voice um, that's in the school districts as well. And we have been able to curry a, um, a lot of those voices, carry those voices up to the state level. Um, the school boards are pretty tricky because the school boards, we, we know, you know, there's a spectrum of values <laughs> and what those values are on school boards. And what we're seeing right now is that a lot of these extremist harmful bills um, they're not only living at state houses, they're being infused into um, school districts by way of school board resolutions, which is why we operate at, you know, up high at the state level and then down low um, at, the, at the school boards, um, which is why it's so important that we pay attention to local school board races and understand who those candidates are, the values that they're bringing onto the school board, and what their intention is going to be once they get into those school boards. Um, we've seen school board members that are very much, believe it or not, in favor of these vouchers. 
how can you sit on a public school board and be in favor of divesting public funds over to privatized education? But that's what part of this national agenda is. It's infusing and infiltrating public education um, with these extremist candidates, whether they're legislators or, or school board, elected leaders. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And <laughs> the end goal of these extremist um, policies and legislation is to create a flight out of public education to private schools. And we have to remember all of these attacks on identity, all of this fear mongering and distrust of educators that these bills are trying to create is to create fear, hysteria, and distrust of our public educators so that families, particularly white families, move out of public education and move into these privatized schools and take public dollars with them. Yes, yes, we're, we're seeing that. There are, there are probably um, three or four um, big what we call hate groups or um, opposition groups here in Ohio that are really riding this Christian nationalism wave. And the Christian nationalism wave is riding this attack on LGBTQ plus identities. Um, if you remember when this, when this current wave attack on public education first started, it was couched in this manufactured crisis around critical race theory. So it was weaponizing um, you know, race and culture um, to say that you know, any person of color or, um, or black communities, anyone that's advocating for their own safety or rights, somehow if a teacher is, talk, is educating their students about it, then they're indoctrinating their students. Um, that didn't get a lot of traction here in Ohio. Um, in fact, we were able to keep those bills from being passed. So this attack pivoted away from weaponizing race to weaponizing gender identity and sexuality. So that's, that's what we're living in right now. And it's very popular to weaponize faith and Christianity to help drive those attacks because we know in the church there's not a great relationship with the LGBTQ plus community and um, particularly Christian, Christian groups. I mean, there's a lot of growing and learning and maturation that's happening right now, thankfully, um, with our, with our um, Christian denomination so that they are affirming and more welcoming. But honestly, we have a lot, we have a, a, much, a longer road in front of us. But there's a lot of fear that can be ginned up in those in those churches and that's that's where a lot of this is is living and a part of that also is saying that our educators are grooming our students as well um, so if you're a god-fearing christian then you need to push back on these educators you need to push back on these poor confused students um, and certainly be afraid of the families that are affirming and loving their students for who they are Yes, the vouchers. Yes, yes, yeah. Which is another reason why we're seeing a rise, what you were talking about in these um, Christian academies um, and, the, and they're popping up. They're very popular in um, Central Ohio right now in the Columbus area. Um, what we saw last year towards the end of the General Assembly um, where were some of these organizations um, going into school boards and getting these um, religious release policies adopted, resolutions, which kind of opens the door for these Christian um, private schools to come in and say, okay, you have a religious release policy, which essentially says a student is able to leave in the middle of a day 
to go attend, to, to go get religious instruction. And here come these organizations that are like, me, 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 me. You know, I'm opening up right down the street, so it's opening the door for them to leave public ed. Yeah, so, and that's, that's a big, yeah, yeah, and I mean, that's, that's the whole terminology around choice, so the students wouldn't have to go to um, a faith-based school with the public dollars, but they would have the choice to do that, and this is all, the ed choice um, is couched in the public schools are failing the students, and because public schools are failing the students, it's up to public schools to be able to provide an alternative for those students to go, and it should be on the backs of the public schools. No. No, not at all. In fact, um, sure, sure. So the question, um, there's a there's a woman in the in the audience that says that she works in um, in education, and when the the charter programs first came onto the scene in Ohio, um, there was there was a lot of concern that the charter schools are not held to the same standards as our public schools. And there's a lack of transparency, there's a lack of accountability and, and reporting, and there's, um, there's even less accountability and reporting that happens with our private schools as well, which is another big red flag around, you know, you're using public dollars to fund schools that aren't fully accountable to state standards and we don't even know how they're educating the students. Sometimes we don't even have access to the curriculum. So we not only do, do we not know how they're educating the students, we don't know what they're teaching the students, and yet our taxpayer dollars would be going to fund that. And there are a lot of growing pains, and I mean, there, there are some significant um, issues with public education due to a lack of funding and a lack of resources where we need to be closing the gap on that and our legislation seems to refuse <laughs> to help us close that gap. Um, you know, we do have some headway in the House um, version of the budget, which, um, which we're grateful for, but there is so much more that, that needs to be done right now. And yes, th that is one of the big issues with, um, with these voucher programs or the ESAs is that we're funding schools that have some of them zero accountability to the taxpayers or to the Department of Education. Yeah. And on top of that, again, just them being able to discriminate, using our dollars to be able to discriminate um, against who they're gonna admit into their schools as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for folks that, um, that are interested in either state level issues or local, you know, what's going on in your local district, um, I would direct you <laughs> not to do any self-promotion, but we've worked very hard on trying to make this information as accessible as possible to folks. Um, we try to keep a running catalog of all of the bills that are active that um, are good and bad, mostly bad right now, unfortunately, um, of all of these issues that are directly impacting our, our students and our, our educators, particularly around funding, um, around censorship, around the professional development of our, of our educators, and then governance. We didn't even get into the state takeover of the Department of Education and the State Board of Education, <laughs> um, which that has a hearing next week as well. Um, but we have, um, we ha I built us a legislation tracker that's on one page, so you can go in and 
you can see all of the bills and then I list all of the agendas every week of when those bills are having hearings. So you can decide when, you know, if you wanna go and offer testimony, um, you can decide how you wanna plug in there. Um, and then on that page, we've also built out a breakdown of each of the bills. And what we tried to do is translate the bill as written into language that's very accessible. Um, we didn't editorialize any of it. We're not paraphrasing. We tried to stay as true to the language of the bill so that the folks can understand. Because um, we, we want you to fully understand every line item that's in the bill and not just what we feel is important. We don't want to offer you cliff notes. We want you to be able to di digest the entire bill. Um, so that's at the, that's at the state level. Um, and then we also have resources that teach you how to write testimony. Um, we give you email and phone number lists and teach you, you know, some, some easy tips on how to, you know, have meetings and engage um, your, state, uh, your state legislator. For the local school districts, I highly, highly encourage each of you to attend regularly your school board meetings. If you can't get to the meeting, at least download the agenda and the minutes so that you know what is going on in your school board. A lot of times these resolutions, harmful resolutions that look like these bills get passed because folks aren't advocating in their own communities. So the first thing I would say is attend your school board on a regular basis, read the minutes, look at what agendas are up for or what resolutions are up for a vote, um, and then build relationships with your school board members, um, with your superintendent, and definitely with your, with your educators because we need to be advocates for what education looks like in the classroom and making sure that our educators have the resources that they need in the classroom or sometimes the professional development <laughs> that they need in the classroom as well because we want to grow our educators into being culturally proficient and being able to engage and affirm every single student that's sitting in their classroom. And we know that some, some of our educators ne need to grow in that area. Some of our educators are you know, on the other side of the bell curve, and some of them are, are on this side of the bell curve. So, um, but we only know that when we're in the classroom and we're building these relationships with our, with our educators. And you know as an educator, you want those parents and those families in the classroom and involved, been begging for it. <laughs> look at what your child is doing, look at the work they're producing, look at what they're not producing, um, you know, look at where they can grow, look at where they're glowing. Um, yeah, so, that, that's what I would suggest. Um, we've got a reporting tool on our website right now where people can um, send us, you know, hey, this is on fire in my district right now. You know, can you, you know, can you help us advocate? Do you have any resources around this? Our district is about to pass an awful, uh, you know, bathroom bill um, that's targeting our LGBTQ plus students. You know, um, can you help us with resources around that? And we have a lot of toolkits and things to, um, to help um, um, build your muscle to be an advocate um, and an activist in your, in your school district as well. And because we work in broad coalition with so many different partners across the state, they, they are the experts in some of these spaces. So we love connecting people in local communities with these organizations and then they can come into your school district and offer a lot of professional development and um, anti-racism training and, um, and so on. That's the beauty of being in coalition. Yeah. Um, the one other, I, I wanna get back to um, the question, what is the point of all of these attacks? Um, and what we're seeing across the country, like I said, is eventually to cause this flight out of public education into privatized education. Um, we know that we've had um, some elected leaders in the White House cabinet um, at, you know, at that very high level that are very much in favor of privatized education. You don't have to look very far to our most recent Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, that was a huge champion um, of, of private education. So um, these attacks aren't new. This is just the most recent wave and what the attacks look like right now. Um, first, it was critical race theory. We're indoctrinating our children. We're teaching our children to hate white people, which is not true. We're just trying to teach our, our students honest history so that they can be better and do better for our future. 
Sometimes that history and that truth is painful, but it's not to implicate or to say that you're responsible. It's just so that we all have an accurate and honest understanding of what happened so we can help healing and growth. And also those legacies of how we've lived in the past influence how we live today. Those systems, the legacies of, of our past, are very much alive in our, our institutions, um, our levels of government, um, how we apportion our, <laughs> our congressional and state districts. So we live in our past. Um, um, and then um, these attacks on LGBTQ plus communities. Since January, there have been more than 450 bills introduced attacking LGBTQ plus people whether they're adults or whether they're students. 450 across the country since January. So that's where a lot of this harm um, towards our students in education is living and ginning up that fear, riding this wave of Christian nationalism and, and using people's faith, weaponizing people's faith to do that. Um, and then we're also seeing um, um, these funding arms, you know, around create, divesting public funds, the um, education savings accounts, um, and the voucher programs. Um, a new attack that we're seeing right now is um, this wave of bills um, that's essentially creating this three strikes you're out around discipline. Um, so trying to remove the rowdy, disruptive students um, permanently expelling them from their districts and um, getting them, yeah. Um, we've seen a couple of states already that have passed this and we're seeing that this bill is getting introduced in more and more states. Um, we know that so many of our students are still in pandemic recovery mode and some of them will never be whole, you know, how they were prior to the pandemic and we've even got so many of our educators that are still trying to um, heal themselves um, and this is not the way we don't remove our kids from education in order to help our students um, but I, I, I did want to put that on the map these discipline bills um, are popular as well and then these state takeover bills where we're moving our departments of education and our state boards of education into um, the laps of our governors which we're seeing that right now too we have two bills sitting in our house um, and in our Senate that are trying to accomplish the same thing, ter parallel tracks to make, make sure that that happens, which is not great either. Um, what I wanna do, I've eaten so much time. Um, I do wanna tell you about some bills that are moving um, next week in case you all wanna advocate. Um, I, w I will say if you go sign up on our mailing list, we put out a weekly newsletter um, that gives you a list of everything that's moving. We put out action alerts, so if you wanna stay up to date on everything that's moving, you can get it straight to your inbox. You can follow us on social media also. Um, but next week, Tuesday, that state takeover of public education that I mentioned, that is having opponent testimony on Tuesday. They've invited opponent testimony on that. It's Tuesday at one o'clock. Um, also Tuesday is, um, that um, the education savings account bill, that voucher bill, um, and that's uh, Tuesday at four. This will all be on our website too. Um, and then on Wednesday, um, the bill that's banning our transgender athletes from participating on female sports teams, um, that bill is having an opponent hearing. Um, and then on Wednesday also at the very same time, happening concurrently, is a hearing um, for a bill that's banning gender affirming care for our LGBTQ plus students. Um, and I'll, I'll say both of these bills to show you how gross and toxic these bills are. There's a provision in both of these bills that requires our educators to out our students to their families, regardless of the harm or danger that it imposes on those students. And our, our schools have become safe spaces for so many of our LGBTQ plus students. They don't come out for a very specific reason. Well, for different reasons, whether they're, they're not ready to come out or it is unsafe for them to come out because of physical abuse, emotional abuse, 
or they are dehomed. There are families that kick their kids out and then we have a homeless situation with, and then that, that there's a whole host of self-harm that's in there as well and a lot of emotional distress that happens and I saw you had your hand up. So a couple of statistics to highlight the risk to sharing with parents. And, and I certainly see the side that children should be supported by their families and we want parents to know. However, um, there is a statistic that says, and it's hard to pin down because it's hard to pin down homeless, but between 25 to 40 percent of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. And keep in mind that in the general population, there's between the, around 7% within the general population that identify as LGBTQ. So 25 to 40% is a huge number. Um, and there were three federally funded studies that were done, one in New York City, one in Los Angeles and one in Cuyahoga County, where youth in foster care between the ages of 13 to 17 were interviewed and they found that between 31 and 33% of those youth in foster care identified as LGBTQ. I spoke with the um, Deputy Director of Children's Services in Cuyahoga County following that study. And because my background was in child welfare, I asked, could this high percentage be related to the fact that youth in foster care, having grown up in dysfunctional homes, may be confused about their identity? And she said she believes that, it, that these children are truly identifying as LGBTQ, and our youth group serve some of those youth who were kicked out of their homes and are now in supportive environments and they're able to come to our support groups. So that's some validity to what you just said. Yeah, and our, um, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, these attacks don't just live at our state house either on our LGBTQ plus kids. Our State Board of Education um, in November, no, in December, after four long months of fighting at the State Board, uh, they passed a resolution that struck down federal Title IX protections for our LGBTQ plus students. Federal protections for those students. Passed a resolution. So what happens at the State House can happen at the State Board of Education, which is why it's so important that we stay plugged into the State Board of Education. We, uh, we have some folks with some very concerning values um, that were elected and appointed to our State Board of Education. Um, some of those folks also repealed our anti-racism and equity resolution uh, back in October of 2021. Um, yeah, so uh, jumping back to the schedule. So we have two of those LGBTQ plus bills that will be, um, um, that have hearings next week. Um, and then on Thursday, um, this um, resolution, House Joint Resolution 1, uh, it will be having, it will potentially be on the House floor for a full vote. HJR 1 um, was voted out of committee last week. For those of you that aren't familiar, HJR 1 um, is, is an initiative to raise the threshold um, for, um, for votes to 60% in order for us as citizens um, to be able to get a ballot initiative. Um, and there are a, a few other provisions in HJR 1, um, but that, 
that bill is potentially going to be voted out of the House on Thursday. Um, so the House, um, I want to say they're, they're going to meet at 1.30 or 2 o'clock um, next week, Thursday. Before that, at, um, at 12.30, there's going to be a rally um, at a church, which is very close to the State House, Trinity Episcopal Church. So if you all are interested in heading um, down south to Columbus, um, we're all going to meet in the church. There's going to be a march over to the State House, and then we're going to be in the State House, um, essentially demanding our um, <laughs> that we have a high-functioning multiracial democracy um, and oppose um, HJR 1. Last week, um, Senate Senate joint, oh gosh, was it last week? It was this week, oh my gosh, and I was even there for it. <laughs> All my weeks are running together. The Senate passed the Senate version um, of this joint resolution as well. So these bills are, are, moving, are moving pretty fast. Um, so um, that's everything uh, that's on the schedule in terms of where I live for next week. Um, I do wanna leave you with one positive note in all of this, um, and we are so proud of this. One of the very, yes. <laughs> you know, the here. Yeah, I, I'm, I, we came into existence because of all of this hate, and I hate that I'm always the dark cloud, but I do want to leave you with something positive. One of the bills, a new bill um, that's in our state house right now is Senate Bill 83. Senate Bill 83 is a sweeping, and I've got a flyer over there for it. Senate Bill 83 is a sweeping um, higher education bill. It's called the Higher Education Enhancement Act, but we know it to be the Higher Education Destruction Act. What this bill does is it bans required DEI in higher education, both in private and public campuses. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, any kind of training, education, professional development. It bans required DEI. Sorry about that, I'm so used to the acronyms. Um, it also bans um, any grouping, organizing, um, any um, um, programs, policies, majors that are based on race, gender, gender identity, or religion. So what that means is we would not be able to have any black student union groups. We would not be able to have any women's studies program. We would not be able to have students being able to organize on campus based on their faith. We would not be able to have programs or uh, programs that are specifically um, built to address racial inequity or discrimination or LGBTQ plus issues, yes. We would not be able to have any of the many, many LGBTQ plus student groups or KSU has this incredible um, LGBTQ plus space called Spectrum that they built out. None of those would be able to exist. They're banning that in this bill. They also ban academic relationships with China. So this is an extremely racist bill. So we're talking about foreign exchange programs, any, any kind of research programs, any kind of professorships where professors from China would come to us or we would go over to China. Bans academic relationships with China. Bans employees from being able to strike. So any of our professors or student groups or staff on higher education campuses would not be able to use strikes to create safe, and fair uh, learning and teaching environments for our students or working environments for themselves. Um, it also requires that our professors upload all of their um, undergraduate course syllabi online and keep it updated on a regular basis. It requires them to, um, um, to put a synopsis of their lectures online. Um, <laughs> Part of the push, some of the pushback against that is, is it makes that campus's intellectual property public so that other universities or schools outside of Ohio would be able to poach what that instructor is doing. And for many different reasons, that course syllabi is provided to the student that is paying for the course. 
you know, we, in, in the admissions and registrations, there's a general description of the class, but once you pay for that course and that student is in the seat, then they get the full syllabi, and we know that the syllabi has to flex in or flex out, depending on how that course is moving. Um, it also has some very egregious um, reporting requirements around um, how they have to report violations, which of course they're very vague and opaque around what those violations look like. Um, it creates a bureaucratic nightmare for um, many of these, um, the administration on, on these campuses. Um, Post-tenure review process, um, student evaluations, performance evaluations, all centered around what they call an intellectual diversity rubric. And you can imagine what that rubric looks like if they're trying to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion and ban programs around race, gender, and gender identity. So that's what this bill is. Uh, on Wednesday, this Wednesday, which is why I'm a little bleary-eyed, um, the, um, the committee invited opponent testimony. In fact, they invited all testimony, um, proponent, interested party, and opponent testimony on Wednesday. We were able to organize and get out, turn out more than 500 students, professors, administrators, and Ohioans who opposed this bill, submitted testimony, and went to the State House to speak out against this bill. This hearing started at 4 o'clock. It actually got going at 4.15 and ended at 11.38 in the evening and we all stayed. There were so many people that turned out for this hearing that instead of creating like a separate room for the overflow, we filled up the rotunda. They had to bring a monitor into the rotunda and line up chairs. And we were there, most of us stayed there as long as we could because there were some professors that had to leave because they came in from Cincinnati and had to go home because they had an eight o'clock class <laughs> that they had to teach. So. I was there all night. There were students sitting next to me all night who lived in Akron who refused to go home because they wanted their voice heard. They wanted that senator, that sponsor of the bill to hear how much they hated and were offended and disgusted by the bill. And some of the students that showed up to testify specifically were there talking about how those higher ed campuses were a lifeline for them specifically LGBTQ plus students coming from abusive homes, abusive school districts or private schools, wherever they were coming from. And it wasn't until they got to higher ed and were around these affirming spaces, groups and students, because people in higher ed spaces tend to be a little, <laughs> have much more of an open mind and they're learning you know, from a broad index of, um, of, of um, content. Um, but these students were talking about why DEI was so important to them. And the professors were talking about why DEI is so important for them as well and how it, it needs to be infused in their, their professional development and the content. I tell you this story to say, we broke state senate history with that turnout. Like those were record numbers of people that turned out to the senate to have their voices heard. And that's what local community organizing can do. That's what we need to do across all of these issues. And that's about getting information out. So I, I beg you all, please, as you learn more about these education issues, the only way we turn people out is by educating them about, about, what's, about what's happening, which is why we try so hard to get the information out. So would you leave here? Please go share with whomever you're gonna be in community with. I listened to this crazy woman scream into a microphone about these horrible education bills. Look, you know, go to the website and look at, look at what's happening. Um, but we have to take our state house back. Those legislators, we voted them in and they work for us. That is our state house. They are tourists and visitors there. They are supposed to be advocating for us and doing what's best for us and our communities. And we need to hold them accountable for that and get this garbage out of the state house. So thank you so much for that. So I wanna take a moment to thank you, Cynthia, for not just coming out here today, but for all you do. And we know you do a lot. I think we all heard that 
and we all appreciate it and what Ohio, no, Honesty for Ohio Education is doing. I'll get the name right someday, I promise. Uh, Cynthia also said she was scared of doing some self-promotion. We're not scared of promoting her, so please, if you're here in person, come up to the table, check out what they're doing. If you're online, you know, I put the website up for them. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. Go check out the website nowish, um, and see all the things that not only they're doing, but that we can do to do exactly what she said and take back our state house and make sure the values that we want Ohio to be governed by, that we want our children to be raised in and instilled with, are happening. Speaking of children, I'd like to go ahead and invite Sarah on up. She's a mother of three, and she has some thoughts to share about some of these more interesting bills. Well, yes, I'm the mother of the three children you hear in the hallway today, so <laughs> thanks for having us, and thanks, Pastor Brian, for asking. Um, I gotta be honest, I'm not a public speaker. I get too emotional, so I'll, I'll keep it short because I'm already getting emotional, but <laughs> this is why this was a good challenge for me, but I'm just hearing all that Cynthia shared with us today. <laughs> I'm thinking about the future of the kids, not only mine, but of the kids everywhere in Ohio and the nation. And I think we have a long ways to go. And I think that I've been sitting on the sidelines too long. And so that's why this was a good chance for me to come up here and say, I wanna do something about it. And so um, I'm grateful to have the resources here today to be able to um, learn and um, and uh, start with my local school boards. That's where I'm going to go first, and then um, and then get to some of the state issues as well. Um, but the fact that the public schools are so um, being attacked so much really hurts my heart. And seeing how well they do for my own children and for the kids that need all that support, if they don't happen to have it at home, it's an amazing thing. So I just want people to realize how much the public school is doing well for our kids and um, how much I believe in them um, throughout the nation. Um, and I guess I'll just, I'll keep it short, I'll finish up. But um, the one quote I wanted to mention today was uh, written by Herman Melville. And it's, he, he wrote, he quoted, we cannot live for ourselves alone. Our lives are connected by a thousand invisible threads. So I believe when you succeed, I succeed. When I succeed, you succeed. Public services help all people to succeed and all people are better for it, whether you use those services or not. Please join me today, tomorrow, in speaking out against HB1 and other bills going across our state um, so that our communities, our state, will nurture those invisible threads that connect us and make us stronger together. So thank you very much. And then we also uh, had made connections through a member of the church to a local librarian, but they couldn't be here today, but they sent in a letter. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that. Ohio's public libraries are the best in the country for a reason. Ohio public libraries are funded statewide by the Public Library Fund. The PLF is currently funded at 1.7% of the state's general fund, which is then distributed to individual libraries at the county level. That is why we rank among the highest in the nation for measures of use per capita, annual circulation, how many books are checked in and out, and number of visits. So there's also something nice to know about Ohio. We rank high in something good. Libraries do more than you may realize. Of course, there are typical services, computer use, story times, materials available to borrow, but we also check out things. Everything from board games and hotspots to traffic cones and kitchen equipment. We process passports and provide notary services. We curate materials for teachers to pick up for their class and to take our story times on the road to those classrooms. We host public programs that fill up 
so fast people have to set reminders on their calendar for the moment to sign up. Pokemon Club and yoga are particularly popular. We assist with printing, faxing, scanning to email, helping users who have never used a computer before, and more. We offer ebooks and audiobooks that users can check out without even stepping into the building. We provide machines and technology that users may not be able to afford on their own. Oh my gosh, I was at the main Akron Public Library, and the whole bottom floor is nothing but 3D printers, t-shirt printing, vinyl printing. It's insane. Including, and she has it here, circuits, sewing machines, laminators, and computers with Adobe products. As with other public funded institutions, libraries stand to lose a lot of money should HB1 pass. The PLF would be reduced by 25 to 34 million dollars per fiscal year. Many of the state's smaller libraries rely almost entirely on the PLF for funding because their voters will not pass local levies. The last time the PLF was defunded in 2009, libraries had to slash budgets, lay off workers, and scale back on patron services. Our citizens cannot afford to lose these resources again. And that is so true, especially for more impoverished areas and rural communities and urban communities. Libraries are a lifeline. I've lived in those communities and seen it. Same as we've heard about schools, about higher ed. We have to remember that, like I said earlier, this is a values battle. It's a battle of values over inclusion and supremacy. It's a battle of values over who should have how much. Cutting taxes to support the wealthiest Ohioans at the expense of the poorest Ohioans, at really all Ohioans, is not okay. Demonizing public servants just so you can get your ideological nonsense forced on students is not okay. Cynthia touched on SB 83. One of the most hypocritical things is the first line of that bill saying that it's so, to promote intellectual diversity. Scroll down a few lines more and it's a list of subjects that are banned. How in the hell can you ban something and say you're promoting intellectual diversity? It is the sheer hypocrisy and audacity that is so shocking. And it also can feel depowering. But what we have to remember is that we are empowered. That story Cynthia ended with is exactly what we need to remember, hear, and take away from this that when we all get together, when we all hold each other in our hearts and with our hands, we can move mountains. We can do great things. William Barber has a line that I have taken to heart, the dying mule kicks hardest. The reason we are seeing this revulsion wave of these hyper-conservative ideals of white Christian supremacy, white supremacists, all this crap is because they know they're losing. And they're losing hard. They're losing hearts. They're losing minds. That's why they have to rig elections with gerrymandering. That's why they have to demonize so many people. And that's the scariest thing. Because if we're not fighting for each other, if we're not fighting for people, groups we may not even be a part of, the question we have to remind ourselves of is, who's next? Because today, it's LGBTQ Americans. Tomorrow, it's black Americans. It's non-Christians. But eventually, it's going to start breaking down to who's enough. And that's scary. And that's why we need to fight this and stop it now. Because as long as we do band together, as long as we do fight for each other, we will stop them. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, 
but we will have one glorious day where justice rains down on us all, just like the rains did today. The rains didn't stop us, nothing can stop us, as long as we hold the conviction of love in our heart. So with that, I'm going to ask everyone who's gathered here to walk over, grab a pen, grab some paper, write a letter to your legislature. If you need to figure out who your state legislator is, let me know, I'll be at the computer at the back to help you out. If you need to know what to write, Cynthia has brought some lovely materials full of fact sheets for you to crib off of, to let them know. Also, we have the petition to get uh, reproductive rights in the state constitution, which is desperately needed in our state. Abortion today, contraception tomorrow. Let's keep that from happening, so sign the petition. We also have League of Women Voters here to register you to vote. If you're not registered to vote, now's a great time. If you're sitting online, you can go to the League's website or our board of, your county board of elections and learn about how to register. It's quick and easy, you'll love it. Um, so we're here to learn more so we can do more. So let's rally, let's do more, and let's make love rain down in Ohio. Thank you. <laughs>